Maria is, uh, she runs the Health Law Advisors PLLC. Uh, her practice is focused on representing employers, planned fiduciaries, and third party administrators in employee benefit matters. She has extensive experience with uh, the myriad of laws, regulations, and enforcement activities of the Internal Revenue Service, as you all know, who doesn't deal very kindly with anyone. Uh, the Department of Labor, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, basically everyone that is trying to get us to become like the People's Republic of the United States of America, uh, and state insurance departments as they affect employer benefit programs. Please join me in welcoming Maria. I was listening to my... Uh, radio story on the car, which I try to do so that I can kind of clear my head when I go home. And I got a, I um, can't even remember who it was, but they were talking about transparency in the most incredible sense that I'd ever heard. A little late for me, because I just graduated my last child from college. But they were talking about paying for college, and this commentator said, now you know, the price that they quote you, that's just like the retail price. You can sit down and talk to them about it. There's, you know, you can be, they can be more transparent, and they were using transparency for college education, and I thought, oh my gosh, we are making progress. I am here to talk to you today about the um, Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare law, as Justice Scalia recently called it, SCOTUS Care. Um, it's all one in the same law. It's a rather complicated law. It's uh, uh, parts of it apply to different people in different ways. And my goal is to really try to give you just a little bit of an overview as to what the ACA, and I'll use that as the acronym for shortness, uh, what the ACA does in terms of self-funded plans. And the reason I want to focus on self-funded plans is because there is a concept out there sometimes, and I think one of the presenters uh, made a comment a little bit earlier saying that it only applied to fully insured plans, and that isn't true. It does apply to the self-funded plans. And the truth is, the majority of Americans are covered under self-funded plans. And the only difference between a self-funded plan and a fully insured plan is in a fully insured plan, there's an insurance company that has undertaken the risk. In a self-funded plan, it's the employer that has undertaken the risk. There is no insurance company involved. I mean, that's as simplistic as I can make it. If I say something that doesn't sound like it made any sense to you, raise your hand, and I'll try and answer it for you. What I want to do is just kind of talk in big, broad terms what is the ACA? What's the purpose? Um, it's really ideological purpose that I'm going to talk about, because I think the reality is a little bit different as I walk you through it. But ideally, what is it that it's supposed to do? Well, the first thing that it was supposed to do is cover more people. You know, the, the, when you think about how it got started, we had these millions and millions of uninsured people. They have no coverage at all. This is the law that's supposed to save them and is supposed to provide the coverage that they need, that they ought to have, that they're entitled to have. So the big premise is, is that you're going to cover more people. Well, why? Because the more people you have in spreading the risk, the more affordable it's supposed to become. I mean, it's pretty simplistic. If everybody's in the same pot, not everybody will have a heart attack, but there are more people to share the cost. It's, it's just a, a risk transfer. The second thing it was going to do is going to really target the younger generation. I, I kind of look at myself and I go, I think I'm past that one. I'm not part of the Invincibles anymore, so I'm the other generation. But the new generation, uh, the younger people that are the Invincibles, they're trying to target the people to come into the health market whether it's through employers, through their parents' plants, or through insurance companies, to take health insurance coverage. Why? Because they're healthy. They're going to pay for those of us that are older and sicker. It's a transferring of the risk from those that don't, that presumably will have lower risk to those that have the higher risk. It's a real simple deal. The target was to get about 2.7 million uninsured 18 to 35-year-olds but I'm not sure that they even thought about it when they did it because by allowing the plants, uh, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but plants are required to cover children up to the age of 26. It doesn't matter whether they're married or working or whatever they're doing, it doesn't matter. You can cover them to age 26. So if your goal is to get from the 18 to 35 year old and you're shoving the 26 years old into their plants for their parents, it leaves a much smaller gap of people, leaves the 27 to 35 year olds 
to actually go on the marketplace and buy. That's not enough of a pool to pay for. And when they're designing it, they don't understand that if you have two dependents, three children, or four children, the cost doesn't change significantly by adding one more. So they didn't get the extra revenue. It's not really sharing the risk in the way that they intended it. The second thing, so the first thing is expand the number of people. The second thing is expand the coverage and define what they can provide. And the concept behind, this, behind that is that uh, there were so many people that had health insurance that was absolutely deficient. And I will grant you there have been plans in their, um, the old little mini med plans that were deficient. They covered up to $10,000 in health care, and that was it. If you had a heart attack, $10,000 doesn't go very far. So the presumption was that there were a lot of these bad plans, and so what they came in to do is say, no, we're going to define what you're going to have. And so what they provided was an expansion of the scope of benefits that are going to be covered under the health plans. And when I say that to you, I want you to keep in mind what I'm saying. We're trying to add more people who were not insured, presumably a lot more healthy people. We're going to provide greater coverage so that they have meaningful health insurance. That's what the ACA is attempting to do. The third element of what it was trying to do is to make it affordable. That A in ACA, that's the affordable part. Affordable was intended to be so that the individual, quote, consumer could afford to buy it. It is tied to what the individual pays to get coverage. Not to get health care services, but to get coverage. And that's a big problem with the ACA. That's the biggest problem that they have because affordability is not tied to the cost of health care, it's tied to the cost of buying health care. And you've all seen this and the biggest complaint, somebody says, well, what's this going to cost me? Right? You get someone who goes into a doctor's office and they say, what's this going to cost me? And they say, let me call your health plan, we'll find out. Well, your deductible is this much and your out-of-pocket is this much, this is what it's going to cost you. That's not the cost of health care. That's the cost to that person, not the actual cost of the health care. So the affordable element was intended to make it so that people who previously did not have coverage were going to be in a position to be able to buy it. Um, the statistics are starting to come out, and they're kind of shocking the, to some. To me, I'm, I'm not surprised, because this is exactly what I thought was going to happen. On the exchanges, you know, we've had them now 2014, 2015, we're in year two. The statistics for 2014 are coming out. In the states that had exchanges, and it didn't really matter whether they were state run or federally run, somewhere in the range of 85 to 87 percent of the people on the exchanges are getting subsidies. That's how we make it affordable. Subsidies means the employee doesn't have to pay or the person doesn't pay 100% of the cost. The government will pick up a portion of it. They only get to pay the part that is appropriate for their income level. That's what makes it affordable. Um, affordable, the other element, is not just the purchase, but they've also tied it to what the individual is going to be required to be exposed to at a maximum level, the maximum out-of-pocket amount. And I say these things to you because you're going to see how they all come back and tie into what you guys are doing. Affordable means that they don't have to pay more than a certain dollar amount. So as they've expanded the services, they have tried to restrict what the individual is going to pay. But the truth of what has happened because of that is that deductibles have gone up. If any of you have not done this, go on your state or federally run exchanges and act like you're signing up. And I, I just get through the process. Don't sign up all the way, but go through the process of at least putting your name in so you can see what's available to you. And what you're going to find is very, 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 very few plans that have a real low deductible. You're seeing plans with $2,500, $3,500, $6,000 deductibles. That's what's available on the marketplace. Very high deductibles. The networks are being narrowed. 
there's a lot of talk about how this is affecting uh, providers, and you've seen it in the news. Hospitals suddenly get drip, dropped from a network. Providers that didn't know they were, uh, they thought they were in this network, suddenly they're kicked out. Well, what they've tried to do is say, I'm going to narrow the focus of the people that I'm going to put in my network. And there's a reason that they're doing that. It's not by coincidence that they're narrowing networks. It is presenting a problem because it is presenting an issue for people to be able to access the providers because there are fewer of them that are going to be providing the services. So what happens then is if the network is narrower and there aren't enough providers in there, people are having to go out of network. Out of network is out of the ACA. Out of network services are not subject to ACA limitations. So when they're designing these insurance plans, and I say insurance as opposed to the self-funded employer plans, when they're designing the insurance plans, the insurance companies are in some ways really putting people into the out of network mode by having very, very narrow networks where they don't have sufficient access. So what's the limit? In network, 6,600 single only. That means the most that you will be out of pocket under the ACA for deductibles, your co-sharing, your co-pays, prescription or regular, the most you will be out at an individual level is 6,600. These numbers are indexed and so they change from year to year. Next year it's going to be 6,850 for an individual. For a family unit, it's 13,200 this year. 13,700 next year. But for next year, one of the clarifications that the regulators have made is that in no event will any one individual ever be subjected to more than the individual limit. Okay? So what they're doing is they're forcing the, the health plans, they're forcing the insurance companies to limit how much the individual can be out of pocket. Once they meet those amounts and they're in network, the plan, the insurance company, picks up the rest. They have transferred the cost from an individual to the plan or the insurance carrier. In network is a real interesting phenomenon. What else does it do? What else does the ACA do? Well, it's forcing employers, and you, if you haven't been listening to the news lately, you, you need to turn it on. You hear talk about pay or play. You hear talk about 4980H. You hear talk about um, payroll companies having to add disclosure stuff because there's new reporting for 1095s. And uh, this year when people were filing their tax returns, they were asking where their 1095 was so they could disclose that they had health insurance. Well, this is all related to this particular element. And that is that the ACA requires employers who have 50 or more full-time and full-time equivalents to provide health care coverage to their employees or risk being assessed penalties. And what people don't sometimes understand is the penalties that are assessed are IRS penalties and they are in the form of excise taxes, which means they're not deductible taxes. So if you put yourself in your business hat on and you've got your business and you're running your business and you know what your net profit is and you have a tax, you pay that with after-tax dollars because you do not get a deduction for it. It's intended to be a penalty. Well. Why would they do this? They didn't want employers sending people onto the exchanges that were sick. They didn't want an adverse selection. They didn't want employers to suddenly not provide health coverage and let the employee go out there and have to do it on their own. The parameters as to how this is going to work are right now evolving. It was supposed to be in play last year. It got delayed. It is in play for this year only for the companies that have 100 or more and they, are, they have to offer coverage to 70% of their full-time people. But in 2016, the coverage requirement goes to 95%. That's a pretty high, high mark. So what does the ACA do for self-funded plans? Remember I told you that the self-funded plan is different from an insurance company only in the sense that the employer has taken on the risk of paying for health care. So what does it do? Well, the ACA says you cannot have an annual limitation. 
You guys are all old enough to remember the plants that had a million dollar lifetime limit, a, a one million dollar annual limit, or a two million dollar limit. You can't have those anymore. No annual limitation, no lifetime limitations. You don't have pre-existing conditions. It doesn't matter whether you're sick and have been sick or what kind of conditions you have, that isn't taken into account. There is that limited out-of-pocket amount that we cost about, talked about. There's the zero cost sharing when it comes to preventive services. Preventive services plans are required to provide at zero cost sharing. Your annual exams, your you know, women's good stuff, wellness stuff, uh, baby things, some men things. Um, a lot of litigation in some of these areas, primarily with the, uh, the, the contraceptive things, the religious objections to contraceptive. And then it also shortened how long you can keep people out of the plan. There's a 90-day maximum window that you can have them be a holdout. So you, the plans that used to say, you've got to be employed by me six months, and then you're eligible for coverage, can't do that anymore. And even the 90-day has, in reality, really shifted closer to a 60-day wait in order to actually be within 90 days, because you can't make the 90 days with a 90-day unless you get them in in the middle of the month, and administratively, it is a very difficult thing to do. So what's the effect of the ACA on the employer? Well, somebody's got to pay for this stuff. So employers are subject to the pay or play taxes, those are the ones that you have that are, for employers 50 or more, that don't offer the right kind of coverage or don't offer sufficient number of coverage to people and they get people on the exchange and suddenly you've got these excise taxes. And I do want to tell you, ex the, the 4980H pay or play rules are rather, they're long convoluted. I am giving you a bare minimum on that. Do not assume by any stretch of the imagination that you now have enough information on what that is because I'm just telling you one line out of about a thousand. Okay, I just want you to be aware of the fact that that's out there. There's also a tax called the transitional reinsurance tax, which is uh, over three years. Uh, last year was the first year, 2015, 2016, and then it supposedly fades out. That is a tax that's imposed on all health plans, whether they're fully insured or self-funded, that is generating money to HHS that it then distributes back to the insurance companies that offer these plans on the exchanges because they are anticipating that in the first few years of the exchanges there will be some adverse selection, there will be some unknown risks that were not properly quantified, there is some risk assessment that they didn't take into account and so they don't want the insurance carriers to fall out of the market and therefore they're going to give the money back. It's all come true. Cadillac tax. That's one people are starting to worry about. I'm not as worried about it just yet. Uh, the Cadillac tax is an excise tax that is going to be imposed on employers that offer rich plans. If your plan is too good, then you'll get penalized for having too much of a good plan. If your plan is really generous, and this is going to impact employers that have low deductibles, because the employees are sharing less of that, right? You share the risk at the employer level faster than you would at the employee level, so they're gonna get hit with a tax. The amounts are still up in the air because they're adjusted. It does not kick in until 2017, I think. Um, I think this is one that's probably going to either be extended into perpetuity or be done with. Some of the players that are involved in these rich, rich plans are the union plans and they are starting to complain and they're starting to raise their voices and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, this doesn't make sense. We, we don't want to do that. We don't want to take benefits away from our employees. But in essence, that's what that tax is supposed to do. In concept, it's supposed to prevent employers from giving these rich benefits to um, the select few people, you know, how the, you know how the IRS always works. I hope there's not an IRS agent in here, but this is how my version of the IRS works. They have what I call suspect classes. Doctors are a suspect class. You've had funky rules set up just because doctors have been perceived as abusing, like the retirement system. 
You have all kinds of affiliated control group rules, all things that they go, oh, you're trying to give yourself a better benefit than your rank and file employees, so they give you this humongous solution to this problem that just is way out there and is unnecessary. This is kind of the same thing. I'm not sure that they really contemplated that there would be a whole lot of um, fight, mostly because the people that bought into the system early on bought into the system assuming that they were not going to be subjected to this, and it's the people that have the highest lobby money, which is your, your union plans tend to have very, very high uh, lobby dollars spent. The tax for non-conforming plans, and that's a real important one that employers sometimes uh, don't understand, and in the DPC market, this is one that you need to be aware of simply because people are starting to promote this concept that you don't have to do this component or don't offer this thing in your plan. If you don't fall within the parameters of what the A says you have got to do, you are considered a non-conforming plan and the penalties are pretty severe. Generally, it's $100 per day per employee. So like if you remember the Hobby Lobby case, which is out of Oklahoma, they had a provision that said that they wanted to not provide certain forms of birth control for different types. The reason was economically, by not providing every single FDA-approved birth control method, they were going to be a non-conforming plan, which meant that they would be subjected to $100 per day per employee for not offering all methods of female birth control. That can be a, a number that's so high that most employers aren't even going to be willing to play. The PCORI tax, um, that is the one that is used to fund a thing called the pa Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Uh, when this was passed, that, that entity did not exist. It was funded with money that came allocated to it as part of the ACA to the tune, I think, the first year they got like 50 million. Uh, they are now way, way above that. In concept, I think they are the entity that is supposed to take information about uh, patient treatments to determine what really is appropriate and effective. And I think the end result is expected to be that they will set basically the parameters of what accepted medical care is. So that if you're doing something that has uh, results that are not really patient-centered, you know, my favorite example, no offense to the men in the room, but is uh, prostate. If a man has prostate cancer and you're 35 years old, they'll probably want to treat you. If you're 75 years old, they'd want to tell you that it won't matter to you because prostate cancer is slow developing and you'll die before the prostate cancer would kill you anyway, so there's no need to spend money on that. And that's patient-centered outcome kind of deal. Uh, it's still up and running. It's still in the development stages. They have not issued anything. The people that participate in it are academic uh, kind of background people. Uh, I don't know how many real practicing, real live business people there are in those, in that institute. It says it's an independent institute, but all of the people that run it are government appointees. And then there's the HIT tax, which is a health insurance tax, which is a tax assessed, intended, I think, originally for insurance companies only, uh, where they were basically going to provide a total of what they sold at in the marketplace and they were gonna pay a percentage of the taxes based on a pro rata share. So the way the tax is enforced is there's a dollar amount that the government says you're going to collect. Last year I think it was 16 billion, and so what they wanted people to do is send in a report, tell us what kind of coverage you have, you eliminate the first certain number, I think it's 25 million goes away, and then they add everything else up and they take your number as a percentage of the total and go, okay, this is your pro rata share of the 16 billion. I've been practicing for a long time. I've never seen a revenue tax bill that works like that. It is the most incredible thing, and the money is being collected by the IRS. It also impacts certain uh, self-funded multiple employer welfare arrangements, but believe it or not, the union plants were exempted. So what is the ACA? Well, it's built around the concept that health care costs are going to decline if people are healthier. That's why it has so much about preventive services. Expand preventive services. If we eliminate the smokers, if we eliminate obesity, if we eliminate all these other things, because we're going to find them all out in a preventive treatment stage, we're not going to have a sick society, and therefore the cost of health care is going to go down. That's the basic premise. I mean, that's kind of how the, the whole thing fits together. By putting 
preventive services with no cost sharing to the individual, they're incentivizing them to use it. The goal is for people to get in there and get treated and get the issue addressed long before it becomes an issue. It mandates that all plants, whether they're fully insured, sold on the exchanges, or self-funded plans, provide these preventive services. And the list is very long, and it's detailed by various entities for different areas, general adult, women, and children. And the list keeps growing, and the interpretation that HHS takes as to what those things mean keeps changing. So the list is going to continue to evolve. The only ones that don't have to do grandfathered, uh, they, they don't have to do the cost sharing are the grandfathered plans. And those are starting to become obsolete for people who are afraid of the Cadillac tax because once you start changing deductibles, you're no longer grandfathered, so now you've got to provide the no cost sharing. I mean, it's this kind of crazy thing that's happening. And the whole goal is pass more money, more cost of health care onto the employee in order to make the total cost of the health care that the employer is providing be within the parameters that they think is acceptable so you are not a Cadillac plan. Uh, on the insurance market, they have to offer, a, there's 10 categories that they call minimum essential coverage, uh, minimum essential benefits, and they have to offer all 10. It is really interesting. I'm not a big fan of Blue Cross Blue Shield. If anybody knows me, you'll know that I'm probably one that speaks badly about them all the time. Um, almost every single state, the benchmark for what these things are comes off of the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan in that state. Almost all of them are Blue Cross Blue Shield. That tells you the power that they have. So that's what the ACA is supposed to be. But what does it really do? It shifts dollars to individuals. It's shifting the cost of health care to individuals in a way that I don't even think the government expected it to come that way. Um, there was an editorial written in our newspaper here just recently that was kind of like sticker shock where people are starting to look at the fact that individuals are having to pay more out of their pocket up front before the policies that they bought on the exchanges provide any benefit. Um, I think the concept was that deductibles weren't going to rise so much because everything was going to be uh, maintained. We'd have so many more people sharing in the marketplace, so many more of these healthy young people coming in. The sick people were still gonna be there, but all these healthy ones were putting money in the pot, so there was more money to spread around and it wasn't going to change much. The reality is, is individuals are bearing the cost. The deductibles, as I told you, on, on the exchanges are extremely high. It is not uncommon to see plants today that have $5,000 and $6,000 deductibles. Now that's high, because that means the individual has to pay that out of their pocket before the plan or the insurance company pays any of it, with the exception of preventive services, which are not subject to it. The networks are shrinking forcing more people to go out of network. Out of network services are not covered by the ACA. The limitations go away. So balance billing, employees are getting the ones that are having to pay the additional cost. They reduce the amount that you can put into your tax favored accounts. You know, for employers that offer flexible spending accounts, uh, it went down to 2,500 inflationary adjustments. It was 2550 for this year. I don't think the new number is out yet. My guess is it'll probably be $2,600, uh, unless the whole market uh, continues to shrink. I don't know if you saw the thing, the market stock market dropped 500 points today. Uh, so if that happens, maybe we won't have anything to reduce it to. Maybe they'll actually just say, first year, no adjustment. The ACA does not allow employers to pay the premium of health insurance. It does not allow employers to help their employees by giving them the money to buy health insurance on the exchanges. That's just a flat no-no. Doesn't allow it. It's taxing more income. If you think about it, for people that were able to use the flexible spending accounts and could put in more than 2,500 pre-tax, 
and now they're capped at 2,500, the additional amount that they used to be able to put away on a pre-tax basis is now post-tax. So what's happening is the employees are having to pay more of the cost of health care on an after-tax basis. The amount that can be deducted on your personal income tax returns for medical expenses changed from 7.5% of adjusted gross income to 10% of adjusted gross income. The employers, the, the tax that the employers are paying to pay for these taxes are impacting what employers then have to provide to the employees. And when you're talking about these penalty kind of taxes, excise taxes, you're paying taxes on the income and then paying a tax that isn't a deductible amount, and therefore they have more revenue raised through that income tax provision as well. So you see what's happening and, and what is really happening in the system in terms of the taxation. And this is not going to change. This is, gonna, this is going to continue to go higher and higher. The more money is shifted to the employee to be paid by the employee, the more the employee is using after-tax money to pay for it. The more that that happens, the employee is paying taxes on his income and using after-tax money to pay for this. But what did it not do? The ACA did not address the cost of health care. It did not address the cost of health care. It addressed the cost of purchasing a policy, the premium cost, as they would call it, but it did not address the real cost of health care. And when you have a law that is as convoluted and as complicated with as many different agencies working on it in so many different manners and so many entities from outside of the government pouring information into it to interpret what this law is supposed to say, the fact that they didn't consider the cost of the health care is incredible. If you don't control the cost of health care, health care costs will go up. So what are you seeing? Well, the ACA is premised on, the, on the, this concept that networks are good. So you see why I always have these disagreements with the ACA, because I don't think PPO networks are that great. Not all of them, but maybe 99.9% .9 of them. And the reason for it is because they don't have an incentive to control health care costs. They're not incentivized to control it. PPO providers set the bill charge. They send it to, in the self-funded world, they send it to the self-funded plan. They give you this grand discount. You get, say they give you a 50% discount, which is extremely generous. Well, that's dandy. But they get to control the number that they're going to discount. That makes no sense. But the concept of the ACA is completely tied around in-network services. You know, I told you the... The maximum out-of-pocket is based on in-network services. You go out of network, the ACA doesn't apply. So they're married to this concept that PPO networks are a good thing in healthcare. I was at a conference in Washington uh, in February or March, I guess it was, and um, had to chase one of the IRS guys out the door as he was leaving because he was the audience was not very favorable to him that day. And I was trying to be really nice, and so I tried to tag him out there, and he was polite, just kind of nodded at me and looked at me and agreed and looked at me. And I said, you need to understand how the PPOs really work. You guys need to understand what they are, how they work, how the dollars are charged, because this concept of PPO in-network stuff for the ACA works if the assumption is that they're billing a fair price and giving you a discount off of the fair price for volume. But if they're not billing a fair price to start with, all you're doing is you're empowering them to charge even more so that you can be in network. Jay will tell you, I work with Jay Kempton a lot. Uh, he'll tell you I don't have a lot of nice things to say about him. So the ACA does not control the networks. Currently, the BUCAs, Maybe they should, you know, they're going to be shrinking. I don't know if you've been watching the news, but there are two humongous mergers that are 
um, supposedly going to take effect. I think their shareholders have had a vote on one of them. I think the other one's pending a vote, and they've got to go through the antitrust division, you know, the, the monopoly analysis to figure out whether it makes sense. But uh, Anthem and Cigna are expected to combine. Aetna and Humana are expected to combine. And they say that if that happens, those two plus United Healthcare are each going to have over 100, million, 100 billion in annual revenue. And so what's happening is, in order to fit into the competitiveness of the networks, they are consolidating the networks in a manner that is starting to really look like some problems with monopolies, those funky antitrust laws that have been there forever and ever. Because now you're going to have three humongous providers. And notice that when you look at this, you, they're not looking at the fact that Blue Cross Blue Shield in, um, in many, many, many states already has a monopoly. I mean, it's there already. Well, I'm not an economist, I'm a lawyer. Now, I have an accounting degree, but I don't practice in accounting too much anymore. No competition generally tends to mean higher prices. No competition has never led to lower prices. Now, it may be that we're going to change the world and things are going to be different. I don't think they are. And for the first time, and I think this is kind of important, for the first time, the Justice Department is actually going to take a really solid look at these two proposed mergers. And there's a lot, a lot happening to try to prevent them from merging because of the fact that they will narrow the provider networks, those three humongous entities, into such a small chunk that there will be no competition. What does it, I should say what the ACA does do. It is providing for more consolidation in hospitals, mergers of hospitals, acquisitions by hospitals of physician practices, acquisitions of doctor-owned facilities, acquisitions of new medical grads by making them employees instead of independent providers. If the hospital controls the provider, What does that do for the cost to healthcare? They have to go up. The, Academy, the American Academy of Actuaries reports for 2016 the costs are expected to go up. Uh, in a number of the states, the policies that are going to be sold on the exchanges, the requests for the premium increases are very significant. I know in Oklahoma, they are anywhere from, the, I think the lowest was 21 or 25 percent up to about 40 some, 40 something, 45, 48 percent price increase. And the reason for that that they gave, which if they'd asked me, and I'm not an actuary either, I would have told them that's this answer three years ago. They have adverse selection. They underestimated their risk. They did not get the healthy group coming into the pool, but they did get the sick people coming into the pool. Surprise, surprise, surprise. And it's going to continue to grow up. So what does this have to do with you guys? Well, if the ACA talks about offering coverage to more people, reducing how much these people have to pay for their cost of, of doing, uh, for the cost of care, the deductibles out of pockets, if the ACA mandates what it has to do with uh, the scope of services in network, but not the out of network, and it does all these things without taking cost into effect, what you guys have to do with it is you're doing the one thing they didn't do. You're addressing the cost of health care. The real cost of health care, not the cost to buy a premium. Not what, you know, what am I going to have to pay Blue Cross to buy a policy for myself this year? You're addressing the real cost of providing the, the hip replacement. The See, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know enough medical terms. I should know more. The stuff on my hand, the stuff on my back. I mean, I could take the body and go. All of those things. You guys are addressing the cost. And if you feel like you're out there without a whole big crowd following you, it's because the ACA doesn't try to address it at all. You guys are doing it. 
And personally, I gotta compliment all of you. I've seen some of you from many states far away from Oklahoma. I applaud you. I truly applaud you. You're swimming upstream, but the salmon do it every year. So let me give you some tips. Because your, your providers that offer transparent prices, some people are going to tell you that you can't do what you're doing. You're swimming upstream. They don't want you there. They don't want you to make noises. Just follow along the crowd and you'll be great. And if you're not, then they're going to try and give you some traps. Number one, employers have to play within the ACA rules. It doesn't matter whether they're self-funded or fully insured. They have to play within the rules of the ACA because the penalties for not playing are way too significant if an employer understands the scope of them. So you can't ignore the rules. Um, you can't have employers that pay only the premium. You can't pay the employee to go buy health insurance. If you're an employer that's 50 or more, you're going to be subjected to taxes. You can't give the employee money on a pre-tax basis to go buy the premium. It has to be taxed and the employee has to go buy it with after-tax money. But it's not designed to work that way. So employers have to be very careful about that. If you're in a plan, um, you have to have a plan that meets the ACA requirements. You can't have annual limits. You can't have uh, no preventive services. You know, I've heard people talking about, well, can you do a plan that only offers the DPC? And that's hard. Could you do it possibly if you're giving them a sufficient choice of providers to choose from and if all of the preventive services that the ACA mandates are covered by the providers that are going to do that? So that means pediatric, adult, men, and women. And if you were doing that and that's all you were doing, you'd at least get out of one piece of the bad penalty. You might be subjected to another piece of it, but you could. I don't generally recommend that you have an employer that's going to offer uh, a program where they're going to either pay for premiums only, because I'm telling you today that's a non-compliant plan from an IRS point of view, and that's $100 per day per employee. That's 36, 300, what, 36,500 per employee per year. Excise after tax. That adds up, doesn't it? A plan is anything that has two or more employers, employees. So if you're a one person thing, it's not an employer plan. Um, but be careful of doing that. Can you pay for the premiums? Yes, you can help your employees pay for it. But if you're going to help your employee pay for it, you have to give it to them as compensation that is taxed first and let them pay for it with after-tax dollars. And you can't control it to the level that you're saying, I'm going to give you this, but you've got to go buy this policy, bring me verification that you did, because then they're going to say you have a plan. So can you give them money? Yes. But you don't do it with the requirement that they have to get coverage. This is, the one that I, this is the one that I think is going to really take some people by surprise. Um, can you have a plan without a PPO? Right now, probably not. It's possible that we'll get some clarification, but uh, I haven't seen anything coming out. The reason that I say probably not is because remember I told you the ACA is designed around in-network services? If you don't have a PPO that has in-network services, they take the position that they're all out of network, and since you don't have any network, they're all in network. How about that for a circular one? So if you have no network, everything is in network for ACA purposes. And you know, there, there's plans that do like the Medicare billing, Medicare plus a percentage, and that's it. And those are the ones that are fighting the hardest because the uh, IRS has taken the position that that is a plan that has no in-network benefit, therefore everything is in-network, which means that they were, they're out of network and there's a balance bill. The plan gets to pay it, not the employee, because you're only allowed to charge the employee the first sixty-six or $6,800. Do you see how convoluted it is? I don't know when that we're going to get anything on this in the near future. 
I think that's a bigger challenge to them because they really don't understand how networks work. I put this in your materials just so that you have it. This is the actual network, the actual, quote, frequently asked questions that came out of the, the ACA interpretation. I personally, uh, and like I said, I've been practicing for a long time. When I started practicing, frequently asked questions were non-existent. They have no presidential value as far as I'm concerned, although the agencies seem to think that they do. But they are explanatory comments. They are not built into regulation and they have yet to be challenged. We're all kind of going along with the concept of, oh, okay, they must be part of the rule. They are not in a regulation. And I think it's gonna to come to a head where people are gonna go, that is not authoritative. That may be what you think it means, but if you really mean that to be what it is, put it in the regulation. Go through the formal notice process and communication process. More will be coming on that. Direct primary care providers. Can you use the DPC plan within an employer group health plan? Absolutely. I think the biggest challenge so far is that there aren't enough of you to be able to offer a sufficient variety of choices for the employee. Because the ACA doesn't let you pick the doctor for the employee. The ACA says that the employee has to have a choice of providers. So if you have one provider, you're not giving them a choice. If you have two, and you have a lot of employees, you may not have enough of a choice. But can you add it on a voluntary basis? I think you can. I think you can. I think the DPC practice is probably going to be one of the most influential practices in terms of healthcare costs because I think you are the gatekeepers. You are the ones that get to see the person first, and you are the ones that have the ability to funnel them into a direction of people that offer transparent pricing that share the same principles as the people that are in this room. And when you do that, as a whole, you keep them out of the ones, the, the facilities that are, I'm trying to think of a nice word. Thank you. I have a different word, but I don't think I'll use it today. Um, I've had this question asked, and, and I want to make sure the DPC providers in the room understand two things. Number one, I am giving this to you as information. I am not giving it to you as a legal opinion. There's my qualifier. Uh, there's very little that the IRS really has done in the area of whether or not the fees or the amounts that are paid to DPC providers are deductible by the employee. Ideally, what you want them to be able to do is if they're paying you a monthly fee, you want them to be able to take a deduction for it on their tax return, as long as it's you know, above the, the appropriate percentage for them to take the deduction. Uh, the question has arisen as to whether or not that is a deductible amount. And in early writings, the IRS took the position that the answer was no. And the reason I think that they said no is because when they originally looked at it, they were really looking at concierge practices where people were paying a fee to be a patient and to access a certain provider. But that fee did not guarantee the provision of medical services. That fee guaranteed that they would be on the client or patient list, and therefore when they called, they would be taken in. But when they came in, they bill the hospital, uh, the insurance or the health plan, they bill them for the services rendered. I think if it's an access fee only, they're paying you just so that they can be on your patient list, I don't think that it's going to be considered a deductible expense under the Internal Revenue Code. But I do believe that an employee has the ability to make a very a strong argument that has a lot of force with it if what you're providing are actual medical services, if you're providing physical exams, if you're providing uh, some medications, if you're providing consultations on the phone, if you're providing medical services that are allowed to be deductible, I think your argument for the employee is very good. That requires two things. One is you gotta give the employee something so that they can have documentation that they saw you or did get medical care, and two, the employee needs to keep the same level of documentation that they would need to keep for any other tax deduction under the code to show who they saw, when they saw, and what you did. Now, I think the only argument the IRS would have is that by paying on a monthly basis, that they really weren't paying for that service, they were paying for access. I, I don't know that that's gonna be a good one. To me, I think the best argument is, you know, you buy a lot of stuff that you buy these days where you pay by the month and spread the cost out. Heck, I can pay for my utilities with a 
averaged number so that I don't have to go up when my peak summer months come in. To me, I don't think it's that different, but I do think that it requires documentation. Okay, I've heard people say, oh, you can't do it. I've heard some people say, oh, you can do it all the time. And there's the caveat, there's a distinction. It has to be a medical expense. That's an IRS 213 deductible expense. Did I keep you on track? Where is he? Oh, he's selling t-shirts. <laughs> There's my legal disclaimer. I, I, obviously, what I'm telling you is, is strictly above the very top, and, and I'm trying to give it to you as an overview, um, hopefully to answer some questions. Uh, more importantly, to hopefully raise a lot more questions and have you look at it a little bit closer. And with that, I have no idea how much more time I have. Take a few questions, OK? Yeah, I, I want to make a comment. I mean, you addressed um, the, the non-affordability part of the Affordable Care Act in the way that you're saying that really the, the main way it's making it more affordable has nothing to do with actually making the cost come down, but is, is just wealth transfer through the subsidies. But the other thing that I think is really, really important for people to understand is the whole purpose of of pooling risk in insurance. And when you have a larger risk pool, you do not make it cheaper. All you're doing is making it easier to predict what the average cost is going to be. So even that aspect, that assumption upon which the ACA was based, if we just have one pool of the entire United States, it's gonna be cheaper, will bring down costs, is completely fallacious. I agree with you, and I think the biggest element missing from that is they have no way to control what the charge for the service is because the providers, and I'm not talking so much about the docs as I am about hospitals, have numbers that are so high and so surreal and unrelated to anything that has any rationality to it that the cost has nothing to do with real cost. It's the retail value of healthcare. Uh, yeah, two questions. Uh, first, as a p potential patient, I understand that when they're out of network, they're paying money to any one of us, but the pa does the money that they pay us, the patient, to a non-network doc count towards that poor bastard's deductible when he submits a bill, my bill, or anybody else's bill to in Blue most cross. in most plans, it will count to their out of network deductible, which is separate from an in network deductible. Do you have a feel for what is that number? Because uh, so far I haven't had any pushback. But I really so we are talking about those guys having two deductibles. In a and lot of plans, they do. I've you. recently have seen some which cross in and out of network deductibles, which is a real foreign concept to me. I think in that case, they would certainly apply. Yeah. But for most plans, they have in-network deductibles and out-of-network deductibles that operate independent of the other. Okay, my next question is as an employer, because that's quite scary. You can imagine many of us are down to being ma and pa operations to avoid a lot of these things. So I actually have two employees, one whose premium I'll pay until she turns 65 next February, and the other one who's employed by me, obviously, but whose husband is employed by somebody else and he's got her on her insurance. On your slide here, you say employers of two people are going to be subject to all those rules that I thought only applied to employers of 50 people or more. The taxes for not offering the appropriate level or the sufficient level apply to employers that are 50 or more. Right. The ACA requirements in terms right. of out-of-pocket deductibles, cost-sharing stuff, the preventive services, that applies to any group that is two or more. So what you, what you probably have is the one that is being purchased is a group plan. Yes. It's just that you have one employee who opted out. Mm -hmm. That group plan meets the ACA requirements right. with deductible and out-of-pocket yeah, and I all those that. other ACA limitations. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I knew that. I thought the laws were changing more because it's bad enough. My Thorazine dose is already high enough. Thank you. <laughs> Question, Maria. Where are you? Yes. Thank you. A sober yeah, presentation you. And, 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 and truly enjoyed the facts. It's, it's a little painful to, to, <laughs> to, to accept, but it's, it's, it's a fact. Can you discuss a little bit uh, the 
monopoly, the, uh, the FTC, and the, uh, uh, maybe the FTC's view on insurance companies and the fact that they are totally protected from any antitrust or anti-compete issues through the McCarran-Ferguson uh, Act. Um, you know, I, I've looked at it very briefly, so I'm going to give you a superficial answer, not a, the law school answer from my antitrust class. The two mergers that are pending are being evaluated on the basis of the competitive uh, disadvantages or advantages that they create. And what they're looking for is basically statistical data that indicates what percentage of the market will be retained by one or the other and how that impacts the remaining providers, whether that has an adverse effect on other providers because they are such a large component. Once you are in there, it's just an analysis of the economic effects of the merger. The insurance company itself is regulated elsewhere, but the merger is what is, is subject to the monopoly rules, the antitrust rules. Yes, sir. Hi, um, my name's Herb Riemann Schneider. Again, sorry folks. Uh, I've been a member of the Carrier Advisory Committee for Ohio and interacted with the Medicare companies that are really the third party administrators for Medicare funds. We started out with a local insurance company nationwide. <clears throat> then we went to Palmetto, and now we're at CGS. And I've dealt with others in other states because I'm involved in our national AUA organization, Noridian, and others. But one thing, two things that really surprised me in all this. One is most of those TPAs are actually owned by two or three monstrous organizations and they're branches of them. They're associated, they're, they're separate entities, but they're owned by one. The second thing that has absolutely astonished me because I've been on Capitol Hill many times, I've talked to people whose names would be familiar, I'm sure, to everybody in this room. But the bottom line is I have, less, have yet to meet a legislator or a legislative assistant who knows a goddamn thing about insurance. And the things you were talking about had to be written by only one group of people. Those are the insurance people to begin with. So why would they not favor themselves? And you talk about monopoly, God, that's the bottom line. You know, I've always had the concept, and I, I shared it with Jay from a long time ago. The ACA, I think, was written to make um, to really get to a single payer system. I think the goal is to make the system fail so that there's no alternative but to have a single payer system. And I think they built some crazy bugs into it to try to do that. Um, entities like this that look at it from a free market mode is not anything they contemplated would pop up. And I think you guys are the ones that are going to prevent it from becoming that. But you're right. And the TPA side of that the antitrust analysis is starting to come up. The comments, the public letters are starting to come up. It's very, very early in the process. It'll probably take a year, maybe two years, because they're going to analyze both of them at the same time. Um, the commentaries are really kind of interesting, because they're starting to disclose those kinds of things, like they provide TPA services. And so you're not only consolidating the insurance, you're consolidating the administration component. And, you're, you know, and, and they're looking at going, wait a minute, all of a sudden you have this mammoth thing up here. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be very quick. I wanted to just share with you something a patient told me the other day. I had been taking care of her. She was non-funded, no insurance. But for some reason, she was enticed to go on to the exchange, and she signed up. I think she was uh, seduced by the subsidy. Well, she had about six months of, of this coverage, and because she was a rheumatoid, she did get disability. So the following time that I saw her, she had, it, April 15th had passed, and she went to the, I, I'm not sure who was doing her taxes, and she was really not a woman with a lot of funds at all, but they told her, you now have an income, and the way she explained it to me was that she needed to pay back the subsidy, and, it was, and they gave her a $4,000 bill, and I wanted to know, had you heard of any of this? Yes. That is, um, the, the subsidies that are created on the exchange are done in a preliminary mode. The actual amount that is available is determined after the end of the year based on true household income. Uh, 
it sounds like she may have become Medicare eligible. If, yeah, if you're Medicare eligible, you're not eligible for a subsidy, as insane as that sounds. And so what they do is at the end of the year when you file your 1040, you actually now know what your household income is, and now you can look at it and determine whether or not you were eligible. If you were not eligible and you got it, in theory, you're going to pay it back, and the IRS is going to send a letter. But if you come talk to me, I'll tell you who she needs to call to get some help. Okay, my question has to do with uh, 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 one of the criticisms sometimes about direct primary care is that people end up paying twice, okay, uh, because of these essential min minimum benefits that are in the plans anyway. Now, the guy that founded Medline, he likes to take credit for getting something put in the uh, ACA whereby certified primary care medical homes, and then there's supposed to be some kind of affordable wraparound insurance that can go with these. And I know that all the Medline clinics go through this, jump through these hoops to get primary medical care home certification, which to me looks no different than what Dr. Umber's doing except they jumped through some hoops. I think the big difference is they've wrapped themselves around an insurance plan and therefore have become a benefit within an insurance program, whether it's an add-on or a part of it, and so they then become part of their in-network. Are these happening anywhere? Are these available anywhere? You know, I've looked for some of that and I've not found a whole lot about it. I found the talk about it, but I haven't seen anything in real life. I just want to, first, you are so brilliant, and nobody knows more about this toilet of a bill than you. <laughs> I've, I've called it the, I've called it, well, I've called it the una, Unaffordable Care Act from the very beginning, but there is a better name, uh, Dr., uh, his name is, his name is Trey Scott, I think in Mississippi, is calling it now the Unavailable Care Act. I like that actually better. No one knows more about it than you. It, it just crossed my mind while you were going through basically the, the cesspool of this act. This is probably the only room anywhere where what she has said looks to the people in here who are thinking in a free market way like an opportunity, right? I mean, this is disgusting. This is gross. And thank you for explaining it, but I, what crossed my mind was, you know, the government never gets it right. They always screw it up, and they've screwed this up. They've created consumers, and everybody in here, I think, I'm seeing heads nod, thinking, okay, well, this is a chance. You know, the people that are going to be honest in pricing are just going to tear it up. So how funny is it, how gross this is, is kind of hitting a lot of people in here as good news. I just, that's my comment. <laughs>